Hello, and welcome to the For We Are Many podcast. My name is Rob. And my name is Trisha. And we will be your hosts this evening. And comrades forever. Amen to that. Power to the people. Fucking A. All Um, power to all the people. Speaking of power to the people... Um, you can check out our Black Panther Party streams uh, every Thursday at 8 o'clock Eastern. Uh, right now we are reading Eldridge Cleaver's book, Soul on Ice. And we just uh, finished, before that, reading Bobby Seal's book, Seize the Time. And I do believe we have the full compilation of that up on our website now. Uh, Yes, we do. All like 16 Um, pieces or something rolled into one? 13. 13. 13? Okay. I don't know. Well, all on one page. It's still still separate videos, but, you know, you don't have to search for all of them. (laughs) (laughs) That helps. Really, um, so we're, we're changing the format a little bit. We've been doing these cross-pollination pieces with uh, Zach, a.k.a. Bread Theory. Um, unfortunately, he isn't able to make it to this episode. Um, but how he does his theory pieces is lets an audiobook play and then pauses it to talk about it. And, well, Trisha and I discussed it, and... That would be a whole lot easier on both of us. (laughs) Indeed. Um, So that's what we're going to do. That being said, we are skipping the rest of the the biography in the beginning of the ebook that we were using. Uh, We already have a a biographical piece on Emma Goldman. Uh, The the one in the ebook is far more in depth. And I encourage you all to read it, but we've already put two whole pieces into that. Um, I think it's time to move on to the text. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) Um, So today we're going to cover the preface and then the the first essay, um, or chapter one, as it would be called in the book. Remember that this book is a compilation of essays. Indeed. Um, but yes, anyway, so, um, we are using, hold on, let me, let me look at the, I don't want to say the wrong channel. Uh, this ebook was put together, or not ebook, audio book was put together by Audible Anarchist. You can subscribe to them on YouTube. Um, they link the same ebook that we did as, as the read the full text here. Um, but yeah, and, and and the reviews say that it's better than the Audible audio book. So, um, yeah, ultimately, I, I I think we should just dive right in, pretty much. But um, that being said, before we do that, um, we've had a lot of new material lately. We've been doing five days a week. I don't know how we're keeping the schedule up, to be honest. <laughs> Um, little sleep or sanity <laughs> pretty much uh, join us tomorrow for <laughs> our other crossover series with bread theory uh, that one's actually hosted by him but we do we're gonna be taking the same approach with an audiobook except for it will be Vladimir Lenin's state and revolution obviously I'm following along in the paper book <laughs> It helps it sink in to, like, both hear it and read it. It really does. That's one of those things that just helps with the content retention. Right. Um, what do we got coming up? I said tomorrow. I meant Wednesday. Tomorrow is the current event stream. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good to think for a um, minute we've had to do with the schedule. Yeah, right. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, join us Tuesdays, every Tuesday, for the current event stream. 
Um, except for last Tuesday's was the Star Trek Communist special, uh, which right. was also live at forweareMany.org. That was that was awesome. Um, that really was. I cannot wait to have Will back again. He's awesome. Yeah, and I mean, I'd kind of like to have him on a regular current event stream and, you know, like, do our usual Tuesday thing and have Same. him add his, his commentary, you know? Um, that being said, if there's things happening around you that you want to see us talk about on our current event streams, our best shot at knowing what that is, is if you let us know. Um, I'm just going to pop up the overlay with our contact information. Obviously, our email is right at the top there for we are many podcast at gmail.com. We are on Facebook. We have a page and the education and discussion group. We're on Twitter at for we are many too. Uh, we're on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. All of those are for we are many podcast. And then, of course, our website is www.forwearemany.org. We do need to edit that slide too to reflect the name change to the education and discussion group and right. include the mutual aid group too because that's an important part of this yeah i mean it did kind of get neglected for a while there we had we we had very limited help and very limited resources so that kind of did get neglected for a while it has been used a little more lately uh with the ida relief um, as well as the eviction crisis. And if it's not up yet, we will get some stuff up there too for the strike funds to be able to help some people like over at the Nabisco bakeries who are, you know, striking because of being forced to work incredibly long days, six, seven days a week, very little pay, very little benefits being absolutely exploited um the workers crazy. have called for a boycott so don't buy oreos don't buy ritz find right. an alternative right don't i thought i still had the empty box in here I, was, I do hold on back to nature i don't know how many big box stores carry them um, but I know that Sprouts does, and they've been buy one, get one, um, well, since I've been buying them, so since the strike's been going on anyway. <laughs> um, but they make a Ritz alternative as well, and they're vegan. And from what you said, those ones are better than the regular ores anyways, so... They do, and they hold up better with milk. milk. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. And they hold up better with milk than Oreos do. Well, oat milk, but whatever. <laughs> hey, anyway. oat milk, milk to us anymore. Yeah. Coming from people who used to prefer the nice cream line milk that was not fucked with. Both of us are on oat milk now. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, maybe part of it's just getting old, man. Like, honestly, like, I had some milk today at work, and, like, I felt like shit. Happens like. to me every time I drink it anymore, too. Yeah. I'll stick with the oat milk. Doesn't fuck my gut up. Right. Anyway, uh, we're going to dive right into the preface. This, um, this is just a little seven-minute introduction to the book, basically. Um, and then it should transition automatically to, to the next video. But obviously at any point, if you want to interject, Trisha, just say something. If I want to interject, obviously I'm in control of the video. I'm just going to pause it. But, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've got the little chat thing up here. I'll pop you up a note if I want to throw in some thoughts. There we go. I was going to say, I like that better in the middle. Balance. This audio production was made in that, collaboration right? with Audible Anarchist. Yep. Maybe turn the volume up a little bit. Anarchism and Other Essays by Emma Goldman. Perfect. Preface. Some 21 years ago, I heard the first great anarchist speaker, the inimitable John Most. It seemed to me then, and for many years after, that the spoken word hurled forth among the masses with such wonderful eloquence such enthusiasm and fire could never be erased from the human mind and soul. 
How could any one of all the multitudes who flocked to most meetings escape his prophetic voice? Surely they had but to hear him to throw off their old beliefs and see the truth and beauty of anarchism. My one great longing then was to be able to speak with the tongue of John Most, that I too might thus reach the masses. Oh, for the naivety of youth's enthusiasm. It is the time when the hardest thing seems but child's play. It is the only period in life worthwhile. Alas, this period is but of a short duration. Like spring, the stern undrang period of the propagandist brings forth growth, frail and delicate, to be matured or killed according to its powers of resistance against a thousand vicissitudes. My great faith in Time, the wonder uh, I'm gonna pause the spoken this, word. I have to I, I have to look up vicissitudes. Nice. A change of circumstances or fortune, typically one that is unwelcome and or unpleasant. So, to be matured or killed according to its powers of resistance against a thousand changes, essentially unwelcome changes. All right. All right. I, I love the power that is in the way that she spoke. She was really a fucking remarkable woman. She really was. And I mean, honestly, we probably could have gone more in depth in the Emma Goldman pieces that we did. Um, obviously, the goal was primarily to tell the story of her life. But I, I mean, I feel like that's part of why I wanted to do this book like as soon as possible after doing that, because I felt like the biographical pieces didn't empower her enough. Like I right. to, to hear her perspective in her own words and not just other people describing it, like what we were finding in our research for those pieces. To me, that's a thing of beauty because she was one of the greatest orators to ever fucking exist, let alone to be part of the anarchist movement. Right. Um, also in the in the chat for the private chat for this, I sent the link to the the ebook. I don't know if you already had it or not, but I'm reading along, and I know that you generally like to. So, thank you for that because. I'd had that pulled up on my phone before, which would be a little difficult to utilize right now. I might fuck with the signal. I've got good signal right now. I'll leave it right where it's sitting. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's fair. Um, just so you know, though, this this ebook is all one page. So you, there's quite a bit of scrolling. Um, Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, the preface is clearly labeled. Um, by the time that you scroll that far, though, we might be at the end of the preface. Okay, that's fine. Indeed. Back to the text. It is no more. I have realized it's inadequacy to awaken thought or even emotion. Gradually and with no small struggle against this realization... I came to see the oral propaganda is at best but a means of shaking people from their lethargy. It leaves no lasting impression. The very fact that most people attend meetings only if aroused by newspaper sensations or because they expect to be amused is proof that they really have no inner urge to learn. I just want to interject right here to say that that's still a problem that we face on the left in organizing spaces today. Uh, people only want to get involved if, if, if they're pissed off at Trump, for example, uh, you know, if they're, if they're riled up about something that's in the mainstream media or, you know, they, I, I don't know. Um, there, there is still that, that struggle of people having no inner urge to learn, um, which I've never really understood. Like, I've always wanted to learn. Same. So to me, it it's kind of discombobulating 
to see people who are utterly against picking up a book or even listening to an ebook. It's gotten to the point where, I mean, we got motherfuckers like Kid Rock going around bragging about not reading. And yeah, you know, yeah. It's like that's not a point of pride, people. Please educate yourself. The only way that we can get further in life is to consistently be learning. If you think you have nothing left to learn, then what are you even doing? <laughs> we all have something left to learn. I won't be done learning until the fucking day I die. There's always exactly. something to learn. more knowledge to gain, more wisdom to gain. And a lot of that comes from not just educating ourselves on history and philosophy, etc., but communicating those things with each other and actually getting different people's perspectives. That right there is what we need because unity is the only thing that is going to get us through this end stage capitalism bullshit. Agreed. I, I mean, it's like our very first guest said back in February that we can argue about the role of the state all we want, but it doesn't fucking matter until we're no longer living under capitalism. Right. Right. And at that point, then, okay, that's going to take in and of itself an awakening when it comes to ethics and how we treat other people because... <laughs> Until every single person is liberated from those fucking chains, we're not done. It's going to take a complete change in perspective as far as people's frames of mind. Because so many people are only out to get what they can for themselves and their own. Because that's what capitalist society has ingrained in us. That if you're successful, that means you've basically exploited enough other people to you know, be be at the, the top of that pinnacle when it comes to capitalizing on others. You know, you move up in management. Those are the things that are considered success here. Whereas what real success would consist of would be, what are you doing to help the others around you? What are you doing to lift up other people out of poverty? How are you going to approach those things when we're looking at not just a collapse of capitalism here, but in other parts of the world too? Like this economy is crashing. Every fucking decade or so, we're dealing with capitalism crashing again because it's, it's not something that can consistently be upheld, especially when it's exploiting so many people. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's been written about at length. Uh, capitalism breeds crisis. Um, Lenin said that imperialism was capitalism in decay, which later yeah. was refined. I forget who it was that said fascism is capitalism in decay, but both are true. Both are, yeah. Absolutely. Both are. They are signs of it dying because it's not fucking sustainable. To have a few people up here at the top exploiting the fuck out of everyone else? No. Something's got to fucking give. We have way too many people in this world living in fucking poverty. And the only way that we are going to actually survive as a species is if we unite. If we come together. If we actually give a fuck about each other. And help to raise the material conditions of everyone. Because housing, food... Medical care, education, these things are human fucking rights simply because of the fact that they are necessary for survival. By ethical standards, that makes them a human right. And until those human rights are fucking respected for every single person on this planet, we are failing. And, and I mean, that has to include access to the commons. So, I mean, we're talking, you know, an end of private property, at least as, at least as we know it today. Um, right. and we're talking about housing, we're talking about food, we're talking about healthcare, we're talking about water, basic yep. fucking necessities. Yep. Nobody should be going without. 
Most of our scarcity is manufactured. Yep. It's made that way to get people to compete when what we need to do is collaborate. Exactly. Exactly. Um, back to the text, though, I guess. Indeed. Why does it keep going back to that view? I don't get it. I don't oh, no. get it. <laughs> It is altogether different with the written mode of human expression. No one, unless intensely interested in progressive ideas, will bother with serious books. That leads me to another discovery made after many years of public activity. It is this. All claims of education notwithstanding, the pupil will accept only that which his mind craves. Already this truth is recognized by most modern educators in relation to the immature mind. I think it is equally true regarding the adult. Anarchists or revolutionists can no more be made than musicians. All that can be done is to plant the seeds of thought. Whether something vital will develop depends largely on the fertility of the human soil, though the quality of the intellectual seed must not be overlooked. Okay, so I want to interject again. Um, whether something vital will develop depends largely on the fertility of the human soil. So basically what she's saying here is that we should always be trying to plant these seeds of thought. It's it's not on us whether those seeds grow. That's that's depending on whether the person is receptive to it. In the metaphor, you know, the fertility of the human soil. Um, I completely agree. Same. That's, that's pretty much all I have to add, is that I, I wanted to reiterate it and say that I completely agree. I do too. Those basic nutrients have to be there. And one of them is given a fuck. Yeah. Em empathy is huge to any leftist politic. If we really get down to it. It really is. And it's one of those things with, you know, that is a root of our problem when it comes to politics is people lacking in empathy and ethics. These are things that should be taught in school. I mean, it's something that's really hard to teach, though. I mean, you, you kind of have to, like, live a, a, a specific way to, to teach that. You can't just say some things. Well, in, in most cases, yes. But when it comes to starting with those foundations of ethics themselves to get people to think critically from the age of childhood and be teaching them these basic boundaries of here are your human rights that are inherent to every person who exists simply because you exist. Here's the extent of your rights and they end where the next persons begin. Therefore, you don't have a right to cause harm. Others don't have a right to cause harm to you. And you build on that. And that right there is a huge thing when it comes to learning how to empathize. Because you have an understanding of, wait a fucking minute, I wouldn't want that harm done to me. Therefore, I shouldn't do it to anybody else. That's something that's lacking that should not be when it comes to how we educate from a young age. Like, I didn't know fuck all about actual ethics until college. And that's only because I took the classes and elective, you know, people like to talk about morals. Well, guess what? Morals change according to your belief system. So that's not a fucking ruler for measuring what is good and what is bad. Ethics is ethics definitely does have some slippery slopes, but it is inherent to the core of it to understand your rights and other people's rights and be able to build on that to actually learn those life skills, those communication skills, um, and to be able to address problems in a healthier manner and go, you know what, wait a minute, this person's being caused harm by these circumstances. This is something we need to fix. It's a great level of understanding that should be taught from childhood. It's, it's sad that most people really don't know what the word means because they don't know the logical foundations behind ethics and how you can literally walk through these philosophical yet scientific proofs on what human rights consist of 
but that's what all of this is built in when it comes to leftist ideology that is its inherent building block its fucking foundation is ethics agreed agreed I mean, uh, there, there's a lot of overlap between ethics and left, leftist politics in general. And I, I mean, uh, I think that that's probably uh, going to end up being like a written article. Um, it, it's kind of hard to convey those things, at least for me, in speech. <laughs> um, it still kind of is for me, too, even after years of talking about this stuff. Um but yeah, that's definitely a piece we need to get down on and get published because it's so fundamental to everything that we're doing here to have an ethical understanding of human rights. Anywho, back to the text. In meetings, the audience is distracted by a thousand non-essentials. The speaker, though ever so eloquent, cannot escape the restlessness of the crowd with the inevitable result that he will fail to strike root. In all probability, he will not even do justice to himself. The relation between the writer and the reader is more intimate. True, books are only what we want them to be, rather, what we read into them. That we can do so demonstrates the importance of written as against oral expression. It is this certainty which has induced me to gather in one volume my ideas on various topics of individual and social importance. They represent the mental and soul struggles of 21 years, the conclusions derived after many changes and inner revisions. I am not sanguine enough to hope that my readers will be as numerous as those who have heard me, but I prefer to reach the few who really want to learn, rather than the many who come to be amused. As to the book, it must speak for itself. Explanatory remarks do but detract from the ideas set forth. However, I wish to forestall two objections which will undoubtedly be raised. One is in reference to the essay on anarchism, the other on minorities versus majorities. Why do you not say how things will be operated under anarchism is a question I have had to meet thousands of times. Because I believe that anarchism cannot consistently impose an ironclad program or method on the future. The thing every new generation has to fight, and which it can least overcome, are the burdens of the past, which holds us all as in a net. Anar I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause that right there. The things every new generation has to fight in which it can least overcome are the burdens of the past, which holds us all in a net. If that's not relevant today, I don't know what fucking is. Right. Uh, especially being a communist in America. I mean, fuck. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't have a discussion with your average everyday person about your political beliefs. Because they fundamentally misunderstand what communism, or in this case, anarchism, is. Right. So many people still think anarchy means chaos. And it's like, no, it literally definitively is. I refuse to govern over anyone else. And I refuse to be governed over. In order to actually be able to enact that without having some form of governmental body means you have to learn how to fucking govern over yourself, which again goes back to those ethical lessons, because if you understand where your rights end and the next person's begin and to not violate that boundary, that's when you can achieve anarchism. That's the awakening I was referring to earlier, that people are going to need in order to be able to even move that far. You have to be able to regulate your fucking self. We can't, we can't go and not have a government body if we still have fuckers going around raping, murdering, shit like that. Um, and, I mean, sadly, we also have other laws being applied when it comes to theft of property, which every fucking time comes down to a lack of resources which is part of the poverty being imposed by capitalism. So that is a problem causing its fucking self there that that part can be easily, easily fixed with things like a UBI and basic housing, healthcare, education, etc., being covered. But um, when it comes to the things like murder and rape, 
that's where people need to understand some fucking boundaries to set on themselves and regulate themselves, stop themselves from doing shit like that. If, if you can actually exert some fucking self-control, then maybe we can get to that point, people, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's part of the problem inherent to even in those types of crimes, because rape isn't about sex, for example. It is about power and control. Murder is often about control. Most murders we see, it's somebody you know who, you know, kills you or, you know, it's it's a fucked situation where someone is mad about some circumstances and thinks the only way they can stop them is by killing you. Okay, well, if you want to have control over anyone, you should start and end with yourself. Why? Ethics. It's the only way we're going to fucking get there. And rant. Back to the text. <laughs> Indeed. Anarchism, at least as I understand it, leaves posterity free to develop its own particular systems, in harmony with its needs. Our most vivid imagination cannot foresee the potentialities of a race set free from external restraints. How then can anyone assume to map out a line of conduct for those to come? We who pay dearly for every breath of pure fresh air must guard against the tendency to fetter the future. If we succeed in clearing the soil from the rubbish of the past and present, we will leave to posterity the greatest and safest heritage of all ages. Agreed. The most disheartening tendency common among readers is to tear out one sentence from a work as a criterion of the writer's ideas or personality. Friedrich Nietzsche, for instance, is decried as a hater of the weak because he believed in the Ubermensch. It does not occur to the shallow interpreters of that giant mind that this vision of the Ubermensch also called for a state of society which will not give birth to a race of weaklings and slaves. It is the same narrow attitude which sees in Max Stirner naught but the apostle of the theory, each for himself, the devil take the hind one. That Stirner's individualism contains the greatest social possibilities is utterly ignored. Yet, it is nevertheless true that if society is ever to become free, it will be so through liberated individuals whose free efforts make society. These examples bring me to the objection that will be raised to minorities versus majorities. No doubt I shall be excommunicated as an enemy of the people because I repudiate the mass as a creative factor. I shall prefer that rather than be guilty of the demagogic platitudes so commonly in vogue as a bait for the people. I realize the malady of the oppressed and disinherited masses only too well but I refuse to prescribe the usual ridiculous palliatives which allow the patient neither to die nor to recover. One cannot be too extreme in dealing with social ills. Besides, the extreme thing is generally the true thing. My lack of faith in the majority is dictated by my faith in the potentialities of the individual. Only when the latter becomes free to choose his associates for a common purpose can we hope for order and harmony out of this world of chaos and inequality. For the rest, my book must speak for itself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, there was there was very little in there that I disagreed with, uh, except for her repudiation of the mass as a creative factor. I think that the mass in terms of collectives of people... Um, you know, the exchange of ideas. I'm, I, okay, so like, I get what she's saying about uh, Stoner's individualism. I get it. I don't necessarily have the same take, so I'm not going to dive too much into this, but I think that's my biggest issue with what she said. Fair enough. Pretty much everything else I fucking spot on agree with. Right. Same. Um, so then we're gonna, we're gonna move on into chapter one titled anarchism, what it really stands for. Um, this is probably going to be the most important chapters of the book. I love that it starts with poetry. You know, I'm not even surprised by that really, but, uh, yeah, let's just dive right in. This is a LibriVox recording. 
It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Subscribe to them on YouTube. Part 1. Anarchism, what it really stands for, from Anarchism and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anarchism and Other Essays by I just want to interject after that little disclaimer to say that that means that we can use it for educational purposes. Indeed. Free license, basically. Right. Anarchism. What it really stands for. Anarchy. Ever reviled, accursed, ne'er understood, thou art the grisly terror of our age. Wreck of all order, cry the multitude, art thou, and war and murder's endless rage. Oh, let them cry. To them that ne'er have striven the truth that lies behind a word to find, to them the word's right meaning was not given. They shall continue blind among the blind. But thou, O oh word, so clear, so strong, so pure, thou sayest all which I for goal have taken. I give thee to the future. Thine secure, when each at least unto himself shall waken. Comes it in sunshine, in the tempest's thrill? I cannot tell, but it the earth shall see. I am an anarchist. Wherefore I will not rule, and also ruled I will not be. John Henry Mackay The history of human growth and development is at the same time the history of the terrible struggle of every new idea heralding the approach of a brighter dawn. In its tenacious hold on tradition, the old has never hesitated to make use of the foulest and cruelest means to stay the advent of the new, in whatever form or period the latter may have asserted itself nor need we retrace our steps into the distant past to realize the enormity of opposition, difficulties, and hardships placed in the path of every progressive idea. I want to interject right here to, to, to point out the parallels uh, with today. Almost everything that she's saying is still true. The old still never hesitates to make use of the foulest and cruelest means uh, to stay the advent of the new, in whatever form or period, that means now, and no matter uh, whether, you know, some new ideology creeps up that, that ends up being, you know, the voice of the left, it doesn't matter. We're going to be facing the same ridiculous amount of opposition and difficulties that we already do. That's not going to change. Right. And the cruelty that she speaks to, the first thing that brings to mind is cuba what we have done to cuba with this fucking embargo for so many years and are still doing while they're suffering due to a crop loss and we are still trying to stand in the way of them trading for food they're dealing with you know delta outbreaks of covid and we're standing in the way of them being able to trade for fucking syringes to get their vaccine out this is cruelty that our government is doing. I mean, despite all of this, though, it's with, worth pointing out that communist Cuba developed two, not just one, but two of their own vaccines. And uh, even with the syringe shortages, um, still we'll be talking about this more um, on tomorrow's stream, but the vaccination rate in Cuba as of September 9th, which is the most recent date given, uh, over half of their population, 57.4% to be specific, has at least one dose of the vaccine, and 37.3% uh, of the population is fully vaccinated. I mean, they're rapidly catching up to us, and they didn't start distributing their vaccines until May 7th. Right. Um, but the reason why I pointed that out is because specifically our attack against them that has gone on for fucking decades with this embargo is capitalism being salty at communism. And even, even with us doing that, look at how much they have been 
thriving in so many different manners. Their education system's better than ours. Their literacy rate, it blows ours out of the fucking water. Well, I mean, we we brag about a 97 to 99% literacy rate, but but what we consider literate, exactly, what we consider literate here, right, is that you can go to work and fucking understand the instructions that are written at a grade school level. Um, But, I, I mean, you know, like, 90 something percent of Cubans can read at a post college level and the average American reads at a fourth or fifth grade level. Yep. There in lies And that that's not thing. hating on anybody that isn't a good reader or writer. It's um, hating that, the system for failing them. Exactly. Exactly. We can do better. We can do better. We are failing students every generation because our education system is not being thorough and effective enough when it comes even to our own language. Look at the rest of the world. Most other places, people speak multiple languages just so they can easily communicate with the other people who live around them. Most people in America can't even, well, the United States, let's be specific, because America consists of two continents. Most people in the fucking United States can't even effectively communicate in English because our education system is fucking failing them. And that's a big part of why we do these streams and why we try to dissect some of this complex literature. We understand that a lot of people simply are not capable of reading and comprehending, uh, you know, like deep college level shit. philosophical, exactly college level shit. Um, so that's a big part of why we want to do this. And I would love to follow in the black Panthers footsteps and like open a liberation school, but we can't do that alone, obviously. Um, I I guess that was a low key call. You know, if you are an educator and, or if you own a property where you're willing to like, let people be educated, um, you know, we need to, we need to start focusing on things like that as well as obviously mutual aid. Uh, The more capitalism fails, the more we'll need to rely on each other. Right. Like, This is an area where we absolutely do need to come together because the fact of the matter is most most people in the states don't have that level of education simply due to fucking capitalism controlling access to education. And this is another thing going back to ethics. Knowledge is essential for your survival. Therefore, knowledge is a human right. They do not have the right to strong arm you out of fucking thousands of dollars per semester to learn. This knowledge is something that you should have free access to simply because you exist and you need that knowledge in order to exist at more than a fucking barely substantiated level if you're going to go from merely existing to thriving you need knowledge it's a human right I agree Um, I guess we'll just jump back to the text indeed the rack, the thumbscrew, and the knout are still with us. So are the convict's garb and the social wrath, all conspiring against the spirit that is serenely marching on. Anarchism could not hope to escape the fate of all other ideas of innovation. Indeed, as the most revolutionary and uncompromising innovator, anarchism must needs meet with the combined ignorance and venom of the world it aims to reconstruct. To deal even remotely with all that is being said and done against anarchism would necessitate the writing of a whole volume. I shall therefore meet only two of the principal objections. In so doing, I shall attempt to elucidate what anarchism really stands for. The strange phenomenon of the opposition to anarchism is that it brings to light the relation between so-called intelligence and ignorance. 
and yet this is not so very strange when we consider the relativity of all things. The ignorant mass has in its favor that it makes no pretense of knowledge or tolerance. Acting, as it always does, by mere impulse, its reasons are like those of a child. Why? Because. Yet the opposition of the uneducated to anarchism deserves the same consideration as that of the intelligent man. What, then, are the objections? First, anarchism is impractical, though a beautiful ideal. Second, anarchism stands for violence and destruction, hence it must be repudiated as vile and dangerous. Both the intelligent man and the ignorant mass judge not from a thorough knowledge of the subject, but either from hearsay or false interpretation. A practical scheme... I wanted to well. interject here... Um... To, to, to say that that's kind of why I wanted to dive more into anarchist uh, literature is I wanted to hear it from their own mouths. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't claim to be an expert on anarchism. I know that I have some fundamental, uh, dis some, some fundamental disagreements with some of the primary tenets of anarchism, um, Obviously, the role of the state being probably that that elephant in the room, if you will. But um, that being said, like the end goal of communism ultimately is anarchism, and the end goal of anarchism ultimately is the high stage of communism. We just call it different things and have different approaches to get there. I do think that whatever ism is going to be born in the next proletarian movement should learn from all perspectives on the left absolutely because in as i was saying earlier until we reach that ethical level as individuals the state is still going to have to have some type of role the difference between what we're seeing here right now versus what is possible in a communist state is that power being held by the people, not by an oligarchy, not by a group of wealthy motherfuckers who just want to pull all the puppet strings, but the power of what is happening in the country as a governmental body being everyone. One person, one vote. On every yeah, fucking I, issue. Right, exactly. Uh, speaking of the role of the proletarian state, uh, Wednesdays, we have our State and Revolution uh, book club streams um, with also with Zach of Bread Theory. Usually he's on these as well. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's been pretty enlightening so far. It's not my first read through of State and Revolution, but as with any other book, you're, things jump out to you the second time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we've had quite a bit of good discussion. I mean, there's even been some points where, as a communist, I was like, "Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know if I totally agree with that, you know, like, and put my own two cents in on it." But that's partially probably because I'm, you know, to an extent influenced by anarchism as well, um, right? And that that's why I think whatever new ism comes out of the next proletarian revolution probably should be informed by both sides of that. Right. The two literally do go hand in hand and, you know, you have to take into account all the pieces of each perspective from communism and anarchism to really gain full understanding of either. Yeah. Truly. And to be able to do as any other people have had to do when dissecting what is good and what is not when it comes to how shit's being run to be able to address problems, that's part right. of where that comes into play too because you need to be able to take the good from both and put that into effect and leave behind the bad from both. Both have made mistakes. We've seen that, and both have made wondrous fucking steps when it comes to 
actually invoking a change in the way people think, the way they perceive themselves, their own value as human beings, their value in the labor that they, you know, utilize to produce things at their job, whatever that may be, whether it's a product or a service. Right. Ouch. And again, ethics. You have to understand that to really, truly grasp your own value. And you have to pull pieces of that from both communism and anarchism to really get a full grasp on the whole picture. Agreed. Um, before we jump back into the text, I wanted to say that the beginning of the next line is a practical scheme because I, I paused it kind of late. <laughs> Shit happens. Yeah. So back to the text. A practical scheme is either one Says already Oscar, in existence Oscar Wilde. or a scheme that could be carried out under the existing conditions. But it is exactly the existing conditions that one objects to, and any scheme that could accept these conditions is wrong and foolish. The true criterion of the practical, therefore, is not whether the latter can keep intact the wrong or foolish, rather is it whether the scheme has vitality enough to leave the stagnant waters of the old and build, as well as sustain, new life. In the light of this conception, anarchism is indeed practical. More than any other idea, it is helping to do away with the wrong and foolish. More than any other idea, it is building and sustaining new life. The emotions of the ignorant man are continuously kept at a pitch by the most blood-curdling stories about anarchism. Not a thing too outrageous to be employed against this philosophy and its exponents. Therefore, anarchism represents to the unthinking what the proverbial bad man does to the child, a black monster bent on swallowing everything, in short, destruction and violence. Destruction and violence. How is the ordinary man to know that the most violent element in society is ignorance? That its power of destruction is the very thing anarchism is combating. Nor is he aware that anarchism, whose roots, as it were, are part of nature's forces, destroys not healthful tissue, but parasitic growths that feed on the life's essence of society. It is merely clearing the soil from weeds and sagebrush that it may eventually bear healthy fruit. Someone has said that it requires less mental effort to condemn than to think. The widespread mental indolence so prevalent in society proves this to be only too true. Rather than to go to the bottom of any given idea, to examine into its origin and meaning, most people will either condemn it altogether or rely on some superficial or prejudicial definition of non-essentials. Anarchism urges man to think, to investigate, to analyze every proposition, but that the brain capacity of the average reader be not taxed too much, I also shall begin with a definition and then elaborate on the latter. Anarchism, the philosophy of a new social order based on liberty unrestricted by man-made law, the theory that all forms of government rest on violence and are therefore wrong and harmful as well as unnecessary. The new social order rests, of course, on the materialistic basis of life. But while all anarchists agree that the main evil today is an economic one, they maintain that the solution of that evil can be brought about only through the consideration of every phase of life, individual as well as the collective, the internal as well as the external phases. Of I wanted to uh, just point out here that, that she's sounding kind of like Trotsky here. Um, I mean, obviously completely different wording, completely different angle. But when he was advocating for permanent revolution, it sounded a lot like this. Can only be brought about through the consideration of every phase of life, individual as well as the collective. I mean, that's that kind of circles back to what you were saying earlier uh, about ethics and being able to govern over yourself. And that's the entire idea of permanent revolution as Trotsky um, portrayed it. So there, there's a lot of overlap here. 
This is one of the reasons why when it comes to left unity versus left rivalry and division, I point out to people that, you know, we really do have a lot more common ground when it comes to our thought and our perspectives than what you realize until you start to actually look into the foundations of each of these ideals and critiques of society and critiques of capitalism and perspectives and philosophy and go, wait a fucking minute. When the big picture comes together, the things that we disagree on are small outlying things. The majority of that picture we agree on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, well, back to the text. <laughs> <laughs> the thorough perusal of the history of human development will disclose two elements in bitter conflict with each other, elements that are only now beginning to be understood not as foreign to each other, but as closely related and truly harmonious, if only placed in proper environment. The individual and social instincts. The individual and society have waged a relentless and bloody battle for ages, each striving for supremacy because each was blind to the value and importance of the other. The individual and social instincts, the one a most potent factor for individual endeavor, for growth, aspiration, self-realization, the other an equally potent factor for mutual helpfulness and social well-being. Again, I'm just going to interject just to, to point out that, um, you know, like part of it has to be an individual um, endeavor for growth, self-realization, aspiration. And the other is the factor of mutual helpfulness and social well-being. In other words, um, you know, being the best individual that you can be but also being mindful and helpful of the people around you. Um, I, I mean, you should have basic empathy, for example. You should fucking not even think twice about helping your neighbor. Right. I don't understand how or why that's actually become something in question with anyone of, you know, like the people who try to put it in a perspective of, well, do I like this person? Or do I feel like this person deserves this? Right. Um, like nobody fucking asked you. We're talking about ethics. And by an ethical standard of human rights, they deserve it, whether you think they do or not. Nobody deserves to live in poverty, to be going unsheltered, to go hungry, to go without health care, to go without knowledge. Totally nobody. agreed. Totally agreed. Back to the text. The explanation of the storm raging within the individual and between him and his surroundings is not far to seek. The primitive man, unable to understand his being, much less the unity of all life, felt himself absolutely dependent on blind, hidden forces ever ready to mock and taunt him. Out of that attitude grew the religious concepts of man as a mere speck of dust dependent on superior powers on high, who can only be appeased by complete surrender. All the early sagas rest on that idea, which continues to be the leitmotif of the biblical tales dealing with the relation of man to God, to the state, to society. Again and again the same motif, man is nothing, the powers are everything. Thus, Jehovah would only endure man on condition of complete surrender. Man can have all the glories of the earth, but he must not become conscious of himself. The state, society, and moral laws all sing the same refrain. Man can have all the glories of the earth, but he must not become conscious of himself. Anarchy. I'd like to interject here. By all means, go ahead. Because this, what she's stating, goes all the way back to Genesis. Um, that story of, you know, creation itself and the Garden of Eden and original sin. 
And that original sin was seeking knowledge. That should speak volumes to you right off the bat of the lack of ethics when it comes to Jehovah, as she calls him, Yahweh, as others call him, just God for others. But this character did not have enough respect for its own supposed creation to want to share of knowledge. That right there, yeah. that conscious of self, that comes from knowledge. You have to have knowledge and understanding to become conscious of yourself, let alone others. Totally agreed. And, and I wanted to uh, talk about the relation of man to the state and to society. Um, I don't necessarily agree that, that that should be overlooked. Um, which, I mean, maybe I'm like kind of generalizing what she's saying there, but um, I, I don't think with a proletarian state, for example, that uh, you know, the, the motif would be the powers are everything. I, I don't, that, that comes down to fundamental, fundamental misunderstandings on both sides. Like we were already talking about. Um, but I mean, I, I may disagree with her wording there, but I still agree with the essence. Well, the thing is a transition of power there of we are right. calling for that power being in the hands of all the people She's calling out the powers on high. Right. Right. But I mean, she said all states. I don't know if this Fair. particular essay was written after her visit to the USSR or not, but she was not a fan. But of course, she also went there very early on in the USSR when they were also fighting a civil war and dealing with outside forces as well as inside forces. I mean, there's there's a whole lot um, that goes into the, the story of the early USSR. Um, Which, I mean, to be fair, was a revolution that would not have happened if it were not for both anarchists and communists coming to the table and going, wait a minute, fuck this shit of being ruled by a royal family. But... As you said, it was still a time of turmoil. So there was a lot of things that were not ironed out, were not fully in place yet. So it's not like her critique was incorrect. It just... Right. She couldn't see the fucking future of what was yet to come once those things were handled and in place. Because, you know, even with... And I mean... Fault, also keep in mind that she lived in, in Western countries and think about how Stalin was painted um, throughout yeah. his entire reign. So, I, I mean, there's that too. Uh, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Right. But, uh, yeah, back to the text. Anarchism is the only philosophy which brings to man the consciousness of himself, which maintains that God, the state, and society are non-existent, that their promises are null and void, since they can be fulfilled only through man's subordination. Anarchism is therefore the teacher of the unity of life, not merely in nature, but in man. There is no conflict between the individual and the social instincts any more than there is between the heart and the lungs. The one, the receptacle of a precious life essence, the other, the repository of the element that keeps the essence pure and strong. The individual is the heart of society, conserving the essence of social life. Society is the lungs, which are distributing the element to keep the life essence, that is the individual, pure and strong. I, love I, actually, value. I actually really like that analogy. Um, I do, too. I the individual... I, I'm just going to reread it because I liked it. The individual is the heart of society, conserving the essence of social life. Society is the, uh, is the lungs, which are distributing the element to keep the life essence. That is, the individual, pure and strong. That's yes. pretty deep, honestly. 
And this is something that I see inherent also in not, not just um, anarchism and communism, but also in libertarian socialism, the, the true root of it, of yes, you have your individualism, but you cannot as an individual not also give a shit about the rest of society. You have to conserve that essence. And that means to collaborate and share of it and make sure that everyone's material conditions are being met. Right. We're trying to move forward, not backward. Right. It's a fucking beautiful thing. I love that. I'm going to have to copy and paste that on my notepad and use it. Damn that. I will copy it and send it to this chat here. Actually, Boom. send it. Thank you. I was going to say, send it to the group chat so I can copy oh, it on my well, phone. Too late. Too late. I'll have to figure that out my fucking self. <laughs> well, actually, it's not too late, I guess. I can. Actually, uh, when you're making promotion memes, that quote could totally go as a meme that we post to the page and circulate. Uh -huh. You see where my brain was going with that. Indeed. I really need to put Messenger All right, on well, top so I can do that copy-paste shit myself and send it to myself. You don't even have to install anything. Just go to Facebook and then, you know, click the Messenger icon and there's a... Like the arrows going all four ways that says see all in Messenger and it'll bring up just Messenger as its own thing. I, I, I just... I, I have not even logged into Facebook on my laptop because to be fair, it's, it's a selfish thing of like when I'm chilling at night and want to just watch a movie or a show or something on the laptop, I don't want to get interrupted with messenger. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's why I don't have the, the actual app downloaded on my computer. I just use fucking Chrome or Firefox or whatever and just close the window. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I don't know. This silly thing wants to ask me if I have notifications for every little fucking thing, regardless of having the window open for it. And I'm like, ah! I just had huh? no. <laughs> <laughs> every time. Like, nope. Um, anywho. anywho, back to the text. The world, says Emerson, is the active soul. This every man contains within him. The soul active sees absolute truth and utters truth and creates. In other words, the individual instinct is the thing of value in the world. It is the true soul that sees and creates the truth alive, out of which is to come a still greater truth, the reborn social soul. Anarchism is the great liberator of man from the phantoms that have held him captive. It is the arbiter and pacifier of the two forces for individual and social harmony. To accomplish that unity, anarchism has declared war on the pernicious influences which have so far prevented the harmonious blending of individual and social instincts, the individual and society. Religion, the dominion of the human mind, property, the dominion of human needs, and government, the dominion of human conduct, represent the stronghold of man's enslavement and all the horrors it entails. Religion, how it dominates man's mind, how it humiliates and degrades his soul. God is everything, man is nothing, says religion. But out of that nothing God has created a kingdom so despotic, so tyrannical, so cruel, so terribly exacting, that naught but gloom and tears and blood have ruled the world since gods began. Anarchism rouses man to rebellion against this black monster. Break your mental fetters, says anarchism to man, for not until you think and judge for yourself will you get rid of the dominion of darkness, the greatest obstacle to all progress. Property the dominion of man's needs, the denial of the right to satisfy his needs. 
Time was when property claimed a divine right, when it came to man with the same refrain even as religion. Sacrifice, abnegate, submit. The spirit... What does abnegate mean? I am going to Google it. Mm. Abnegate. Uh, means renounce or reject. Okay. That makes sense. But I wasn't sure. The spirit of anarchism. The spirit of anarchism <laughs> has lifted man from his prostrate position. He now stands erect with his face toward the light. He has learned to see the insatiable, devouring, devastating nature of property, and he is preparing to strike the monster dead. Property is robbery, said the great French anarchist Proudhon. Yes, but without risk and danger to the robber. Monopolizing the accumulated efforts of man, property has robbed him of his birthright and has turned him loose a pauper and an outcast. Property has not... Proudhon, by the way, was also uh, an early influencer in, or of, rather, the Black Panther Party. Yep, I remember reading his name in some of their material, and I can't remember exactly where, but now I want to find it. It was <laughs> in, it was in Seize the Time. I, I thought so, it's which chapter. <laughs> oh, well, fair. Back to the text not even a time-worn excuse that man does not create enough to satisfy all needs. The ABC student of economics knows that the productivity of labor within the last few decades far exceeds normal demand a hundredfold. But what are normal demands to an abnormal institution? The only demand that property recognizes is its own gluttonous appetite for greater wealth because wealth means power, the power to subdue, to crush, to exploit, the power to enslave, to outrage, to degrade. America is particularly boastful of her great power, her enormous national wealth. Poor America, of what avail is all her wealth if the individuals comprising the nation are wretchedly poor? if they live in squalor and filth and crime, with hope and joy gone, a homeless, soilless army of human prey. Okay, so the, the wording of this, how descriptive it is, um, I, I mean, I just want to reread this last, like, three sentences here. America is particularly boastful of her great power, her enormous national wealth. Poor America, of what avail is all her wealth if the individuals comprising the, name, the nation are wretchedly poor, if they live in squalor, in filth, in crime, with hope and joy gone, a homeless, soilless army of human prey. If that doesn't accurately describe what capitalism has done to this country, I don't know what will. Right. That was not only applicable then but prophetic of what was to come because those factors have only gotten worse since right look at the economic inequality that we have here that is just steadily fucking grown oh yeah i mean we were talking the other day about how it's gotten so much worse since the occupy movement right by the way the 10 year anniversary is coming up in just a few days there are uh, anniversary marches, uh, climate marches, and all sorts of other things going on uh, surrounding the 10th anniversary. So I recommend visiting OccupyWallStreetNYC.org, I think, or maybe it's just OccupyWallStreet.org. Um, they, have, they have some stories, you know, kind of reflecting on Occupy, and they also have information about current and upcoming events. Um, yeah, September 17th, it's right around the corner. Yep, just a few more days. 
Hard to believe it's been a decade. I mean, I know we didn't start till October in Flint, but damn, it's been a decade. I know. <laughs> That's wild, yeah. isn't it? It is. I, I always feel like a fucking grandpa telling internet leftists, <laughs> back in my day, we had the Occupy Wall Street movement. Well, it's making a comeback. So, um, yeah. Because that's the thing, the Occupy movement never died. Never really no, did. No, I, I mean, it did fall apart, but it, it, it also grew into other organizations. Right. And pretty much, at least all of us who I'm still in contact with, still hold that same spirit when it comes to addressing the fucking problems that we are plagued with in this country and around the world. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, uh, uh, at Occupy, we referred to ourselves the 99%, but like getting involved in reading Marx was actually pretty easy from that context, you know, just replace the proletariat with the 99%. Precisely. Replace the bourgeoisie or the petty bourgeoisie with who we were referring to as the one percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that I I did not even realize until we started actually digging into theory and philosophy of like, hey, these ideals we fucking held forever. This is where they came from. Holy shit! <laughs> you know. Right. Right. And I mean, don't get me wrong, like the, the movement referring to Occupy, of course, was uh, primarily organized by anarchists, but like there was a lot of, of communist and Marxist influence. Um, well, yeah, you see that even in the General Assembly alone, because again, it comes down to everyone has a say. Everyone has a vote. Yeah. Everyone has the right to block if there's something that they're absolutely ethically dead set against. Yep. Um, it's true horizontal organization when it comes to the quote unquote government body because the government body is everyone yep anyway uh, I just wanted to interject to, to point that out and of course okay. you know as usual we somehow related it to Occupy Wall Street and went down a rabbit hole <laughs> we're good at rabbit holes. Yeah, Pretty well, and we're, and, and we're good at tying Occupy to the modern world because it was born in the modern world. I think that's what it comes down to for me. Right. I mean, Occupy is the closest damn thing we've had to a Vanguard party in my lifetime. Man, we really do need to actually legit put together an Occupy party. Because that is true representation. That is, you know, bringing everything to General Assembly. That example needs to be led to others who are still falling in line with the two-party bullshit. And this right, how about we do no parties? Representative government that doesn't really represent you. Awkward. Right. right. <laughs> And, and I mean, with all of its, uh, you know, shortcomings and fallbacks, I mean, I think that Occupy was still a net positive. Were we really talking about wealth inequality prior to Occupy? Fuck no. No. I mean, it's, it's gotten to a point where fucking Business Insider does a segment every week on wealth inequality. Right. Which is kind of fucking... Wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that sums it up. <laughs> Maybe it's Forbes, not Business Insider, but either way, it's one of those super capitalist publications. Right, and they're even talking about it. Whereas, at least, you know, as a country, we were not talking about it enough back then. No, we were still so, talking um, about fucking 9-11. <laughs> like, one of the things that brought me to the table was um, everything with the student loan crisis that we have going on here because I'm part of that. I've got like 50k in student loans and interest, you know, 50 something um, that I'll never be able to fucking repay. And 
that right there was one of those things that seeing that this is happening across the board to so many people and understanding what I do from having taken those classes at U of M on logic and ethics and going, wait a minute, um, my professor was trying to fucking radicalize us into calling for education being free because of knowledge being a human right. And I love him for that. Um, but it didn't register until a couple of years later when that discussion really came to the table. And, you know, besides that, there, there was so many different factors. All the people who came together had dealt with a different facet of economic hardship, economic inequality affecting them drastically to the point where people are having trouble surviving. And that brought us all together to go, wait a minute, when you put all these pieces together from your experience and yours and yours and yours, and we see this whole picture, we are getting fucked really hard by capitalism. Yeah. Over the last few years, seeing more and more people come to that realization of, holy fuck, we're being fucked by capitalism, is the one thing that gives me some fucking hope. Because it's like, okay, maybe we can actually fucking change this. And right. Put an end to this. Because this is causing so many people to lose their homes, lose their, you know, ability to work, lose their entire, you know... What are you supposed to do when you can't afford housing, food, clothing, basics? What the fuck are you supposed to do when the system itself fucks you out of access? Yeah. Agreed. Um, back to the text. <laughs> It is generally conceded that unless the returns of any business venture exceed the cost, bankruptcy is inevitable. But those engaged in the business of producing wealth have not yet learned even this simple lesson. Every year the cost of production in human life is growing larger. 50,000 killed, 100,000 wounded in America last year. The returns to the masses who help to create wealth are ever getting smaller. Yet America continues to be blind to the inevitable bankruptcy of our business of production. Nor is this the only crime of the latter. Still more fatal is the crime of turning the producer into a mere particle of a machine with less will and decision than his master of steel and iron. Man is being robbed not merely of the products of his labor, but of the power of free initiative, of originality, and the interest in or desire for the things he is making. Real wealth consists in things of utility and beauty, in things that help to create strong, beautiful bodies and surroundings inspiring to live in. But if man is doomed to wind cotton around a spool, or dig coal, or build roads for thirty years of his life, there can be no talk of wealth. What he gives to the world is only gray and hideous things, reflecting a dull and hideous existence. Too weak to live, too cowardly to die. Strange to say, there are people who extol this deadening method of centralized production as the proudest achievement of our age. They fail utterly to realize that if we are to continue in machine subserviency, our slavery is more complete than was our bondage to the king. Damn. They do not want to know that centralization is not only the death knell of liberty, but also of health and beauty, of art and science, all these being impossible in a clock-like mechanical atmosphere. Anarchism cannot but repudiate such a method of production. Its goal is the freest possible expression of all the latent powers of the individual. Oscar Wilde defines a perfect personality as one who develops under perfect conditions, who is not wounded, maimed, or in danger. A perfect personality, then, is only possible in a state of society where man is free to choose the mode of work, the conditions of work, and the freedom to work. One to whom the making of a table, the building of a house, or the tilling of the soil, 
is what the painting is to the artist, and the discovery to the scientist, the result of inspiration, of intense longing, and deep interest in work as a creative force. That being the ideal of anarchism, its economic arrangements must consist of voluntary, productive, and distributive associations, gradually developing into free communism as the best means of producing with the least waste of human energy. Anarchism, however, also recognizes the right of the individual, or numbers of individuals, to arrange at all times for other forms of work in harmony with their tastes and desires. Such free display of human energy being possible... I'm sorry, what? I just want to inject or interject really quick that UBI is how we make that happen. Universal basic yeah. income. I agree. I mean, I also have concerns about it being used much in the way that the New Deal was um, to 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 placate against the revolution. But on the other hand, it could have the complete opposite effect of that. It could give more uh, people more time to actually like follow their beliefs. Um, it could give people more time to do more research. Um, I mean, there there's definitely positives that could come from it, but I'm also concerned that it would placate the masses. That being said, I'm never going to vote against a reform that's going to lift the material conditions of the people of this nation or the world. Um, you know, given that we have as much apathy out there as we do, there are certain people who may be placated by it, but in most cases, it's literally giving people the freedom to work that she was referring to of, you don't have to worry about losing your ass if you leave an employer that sucks. You can readily walk yeah. the fuck away and go, fuck you, and you know, pursue any other thing that you want without worrying about losing your ass if you have housing and food and clothing and, you know, clothing and things like that, toiletries, etc. Those are things that would be covered with the UBI, you know? Right. So, yeah. just saying, that's something that I think would, would free up people to not only be able to pursue other interests as far as learning more about say philosophy like we are um but also you know the other day someone posed us with a question on the uh facebook page asking how this would apply to artists when it comes to reaching communism and anarchism and it's this right here that if we had that you would actually have the liberty to be an artist without having to worry about selling something that you've created in order to just feed your belly. You could be feeding your soul and be able to share that beauty with the rest of the world without your fucking existence being dependent on how much someone else is willing to pay you for that. Yeah. It'd be very liberating to not have to worry about, am I still going to have a roof over my head and food in my belly if this canvas doesn't sell Right. Right. This entire concept of a starving artist, well, I mean, it stems from feudalism, really, but um, right. amplified by capitalism, 100%. It's so difficult to make a living doing really almost anything that you would actually enjoy. Right. And your worth is always going to be limited to what somebody is willing to pay for it, as, as you just pointed out. Right. Yep. Yeah. Back to the text. <laughs> Only under complete individual and social freedom, anarchism directs its forces against the third and greatest foe of all social equality, namely the state organized authority or statutory law, the dominion of human conduct. Just as religion has fettered the human mind, and as property or the monopoly of things has subdued and stifled man's needs, so has the state enslaved his spirit, dictating every phase of conduct. 
All government, in essence, says Emerson, is tyranny. It matters not whether it is government by divine right or majority rule. In every instance, its aim is the absolute subordination of the individual. Refrain. I just wanted to put another like disclaimer here that well, obviously, uh, as, as a communist, I don't necessarily agree with this. Um, I'll leave it at that. I'm not. I'm not trying to attack these beliefs. I'm trying to portray them in a fair way. Um, just you know, all, I guess all I'm trying to say is that um, my view on a proletarian government is is different. Fair. When it's everyone having a say, it's a little different, a lot different than a few people having that monopoly that she's referring to. Right. Um, you know, uh, there's seldom few areas where we actually need any law. And it also, again, goes back to ethics of having a rule over yourself. Yeah. Have some control. Be self governing. And, you know, I mean, for fuck's sake, don't go around murdering and raping people, which would be, you know, like instances where we would actually need to have any kind of intervention like that of actually subordinating anyone by, you know, putting them in jail. But in pretty much every other aspect, she's not wrong. She's really not wrong, at least not when it comes to the things that they do. And by they, I'm talking about the cops, the court system, etc. That um, literally only exist to subordinate you, whether it be taking your money or throwing you in jail or both. It is tyranny. Okay, like when you have stupid shit, when you can go to fucking jail for not returning a library book because... Now you've been considered a thief. People lose books. Charge me for the book. Um, if if you're facing stupidity like I am right now of a criminal charge of unlawful storage of an RV for parking in my own driveway when I come over here to this, like I'm traveling most of the fucking time, you know, hardly ever even in town. But I get hit with a case for unlawful storage. And I'm like, this is not storage. It's in use. But that stupid shit that they're bitching about, whether I'm on my driveway or next to or behind the house, comes with a 93 days in jail and $500 a day fucking fine if you're found guilty. And I'm like, guilty of what? Where there is no victim, there is no crime. Who the fuck am I harming by whether I'm parked on the pavement or if I go ahead and like put gravel alongside the fucking house to park there. I'm not fucking harming anybody. My presence does not affect any fucking buddy else at all. So stupid laws like that, those are governance solely for the purpose of subordinating you, of taking more money from you. And these are the people who's you know, paychecks are paid by your fucking tax dollars. So they're your employees. And they got the fucking audacity to put together statutes like that that exist only to fucking swindle money out of you and beat you down and make you feel like you are being, you know, controlled by this quote unquote authority. Motherfucker, you are not an authority. You are an employee. To quote Shadid, how can you be my fucking authority? You are not my author. Right. That right there is the type of shit that she is speaking to there of it's tyrannical. But none of that, none of that is what we envision when we're talking about a government system set up like the General Assembly. That is a communist government where... <coughs> Everyone has a say. And I can guarantee you, if the people around here were given a say about some shit like that, they would utterly refuse. They would vote that shit down 
and I know that just from looking around the neighborhood and seeing how many other people have RVs, fifth wheels, shit like that in their driveways of like, okay, these are stupid laws that literally the people who pay you your fucking paycheck don't agree with. You don't have a right to impose them. That's the type of stupid shit. That is tyrannical. Other shit like what I've witnessed during the last couple of times I've had to go visit that fucking courthouse. Um, there's shit that's still happening to this day. Like, okay, it's sad when I see person after person going up in this courtroom getting hit for driving without a license, but no other fucking charge. So it's like you had to have made something up for a reason to pull everyone over in order to even find out that they didn't have a fucking license to give them that fucking charge in every person in that courtroom who was facing that charge was black. They got pulled over for driving while black. I mean, I'm not surprised by that. And, and I mean, like, if you live in a primar primarily white area, instead of the color of your skin, it's going to be the quality of your car. If you're driving a 20-year-old beater with a loud exhaust, you're going to get pulled over on principle. If you've got a car full of people, forget it. Right. And it's one of those things where it's like... This systemic racism bullshit, they are literally targeting people because, you know, of racist fucking bullshit just to try to, again, weasel some fucking money out of their pockets. Right. That's tyranny. That's fucking tyranny. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why, as... You know, she was reading that last paragraph. I'm over here like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shut that bullshit down. Yeah. If you are not causing harm to another person, there is no crime. Ethics, man. And ethics supersede the law every fucking time. We've had a lot of laws on our books that were unethical we have since gotten yoinked the fuck out of our law books because everyone was going, wait a fucking minute, no. We're not done with that process. That's part of what she's speaking of, dismantling there. is tearing right. apart that authoritarian bullshit right there that serves no purpose except to oppress. Indeed. Back to the tax. To the American government, the greatest American anarchist, David Thoreau, said, Government, what is it but a tradition, though a recent one, endeavoring to transmit itself unimpaired to posterity, but each instance losing its integrity? It has not the vitality and force of a single living man. Law never made man a whit more just, and by means of their respect for it, even the well-disposed are daily made agents of injustice. Indeed, the keynote of government is injustice. With the arrogance and self-sufficiency of the king who could do no wrong, governments ordain, judge, condemn, and punish the most insignificant offenses. While I'm just going to pause that for two seconds to say... She's talking about the exact type of shit that we were just talking about. Uh-huh. Insignificant offenses. Right. <laughs> well, maintaining I, themselves sorry. by the greatest of all... A second. I, I would just love to express why that fucking laugh came out like that, because it's like, oh, I'm sorry, did I offend your bougie ideal of what something should look like? Yeah, pretty much. It's blight if it's in the driveway. It's not blight if it's next to the house. What? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Insignificant offenses. I don't give a fuck who I offend by where I park. Anyway. Back to the text. All offenses. The annihilation of individual liberty. Thus, Weta is right when she 
maintains that the state only aims instilling those qualities in its public by which its demands are obeyed and its exchequer is filled its highest attainment is the reduction of mankind to clockwork in its atmosphere all those finer and more delicate liberties which require treatment and spacious expansion inevitably dry up and perish the state requires a tax-paying machine in which there is no hitch an exchequer in which there is never a deficit and a public monotonous obedient colorless spiritless moving humbly like a flock of sheep along a straight high road between two walls i'm willing to bet that when she wrote this the uh the federal reserve was not a thing yet i mean she's talking about there never being a deficit right i mean i'm just i'm just saying i'm just saying there's been a deficit for like 80 years now six six i don't know decades yes many decades right moving on (laughs) yet even a flock of sheep would resist the chicanery of the state if it were not for the corruptive tyrannical and oppressive methods it employs to serve its purposes Therefore, Bakunin repudiates the state as synonymous with the surrender of the liberty of the individual or small minorities, the destruction of social relationship, the curtailment or complete denial even of life itself for its own aggrandizement. The state is the altar of political freedom, and like the religious altar, it is maintained for the purpose of human sacrifice. In fact, There is hardly a modern thinker who does not agree that government, organized authority, or the state is necessary only to maintain or protect property and monopoly. It is proven efficient in that function only. Goddamn right. Even George Bernard Shaw, who hopes for the miraculous from the state under Fabianism, nevertheless admits that it is at present a huge machine for robbing and slave driving of the poor by brute force. This being the case, it is hard to see why the clever prefacer wishes to uphold the state after poverty shall have ceased to exist. And she's coming to a key point of um, Lenin, really. Um, yeah. But, I, I, I mean, that's, that's the idea of the proletarian state, is to make sure these needs are met so it will wither away. Um, mm-hmm. So, I, I mean, I, it went in, in State and Revolution, and in the second chapter talked about that. Um, so, I mean, maybe maybe there's a bit of a misunderstanding there. But the, the point is, though, is that uh, in the case of a proletarian state, the entire thing is set up to weather away. Yes. That is the whole point of meeting all of the material conditions for life, ending poverty. And when you end poverty, you no longer need those things in place for the state. Because poverty is the cause of most crime. And I'll put that word crime in quotations because life matters more than property. Agreed. Unfortunately, there are still a number of people who continue in the fatal belief that government rests on natural laws, that it maintains social order and harmony, that it diminishes crime, and that it prevents the lazy man from fleecing his fellows. I shall therefore examine these contentions. A natural law is that factor in man which asserts itself freely and spontaneously without any external force, in harmony with the requirements of nature. For instance, the demand for nutrition, for sex gratification, for light, air, and exercise is a natural law. But its expression needs not the machinery of government, needs not the club, the gun, the handcuff, or the prison. To obey such laws, if we may call it obedience, requires only spontaneity and free opportunity. 
that governments do not maintain themselves through such harmonious factors is proven by the terrible array of violence, force, and coercion all governments use in order to live. Thus Blackstone is right when he says, human laws are invalid because they are contrary to the laws of nature. Unless it be the order of Warsaw after the slaughter of thousands of people, it is difficult to ascribe to governments any capacity for order or social harmony. Order derived through submission and maintained by terror is not much of a safe guarantee. Yet that is the only order that governments have ever maintained. True social harmony grows naturally out of solidarity of interests. In a society where those who always work never have anything, while those who never work enjoy everything, solidarity of interest is non-existent. Hence, social harmony is but a myth. The only way organized authority meets this grave situation is by extending still greater privileges to those who have already monopolized the earth, and by still further enslaving the disinherited masses. Thus, the entire arsenal of government, laws, police, soldiers, the courts, legislatures, prisons, is strenuously engaged in harmonizing the most antagonistic elements in society. Uh -huh. The most absurd apology for authority and law is that they serve to diminish crime. Aside from the fact that the state is itself the greatest criminal, breaking every written and natural law, stealing in the form of taxes, killing in the form of war and capital punishment, it has come to an absolute standstill in coping with crime. It has failed utterly to destroy or even minimize the horrible scourge of its own creation. I wanted to interject here to point out once again that capitalism breeds crises. Um, so, I, I mean, uh, of course capitalism is not going to minimize this, this scourge of its own creation. Um and neither will these governmental bodies that she's referring to, because I'll just take a moment to also point out that the police overall have a success rate of solving 4% of crimes. Four. Four fucking percent. Right. Um, I, I was kind of going to go into a little more detail about what crime is, but she's actually about to do that herself, so she's probably going to do that more eloquently than I can. I, I love the way she speaks. Same. Crime is not but misdirected energy. So long as every instant of today, economic, political, social, and moral, conspires to misdirect human energy into wrong channels, so long as most people are out of place doing the things they hate to do, living a life they loathe to live, crime will be inevitable, and all the laws and the statutes can only increase but never do away with crime. What does society, as it exists today, know of the process of despair, the poverty, the horrors, the fearful struggle the human soul must pass on its way to crime and degradation? Who that knows this terrible process can fail to see the truth in these words of Peter Kropotkin? Those who will hold the balance between the benefits thus attributed to law and punishment and the degrading effect of the latter on humanity, those who will estimate the torrent of depravity poured abroad in human society by the informer, favored by the judge even, and paid for in clinking cash by governments, under the pretext of aiding to unmask crime, those who will go within prison walls and there see what human beings become when deprived of liberty, when subjected to the care of brutal keepers, to coarse, cruel words, to a thousand stinging, piercing humiliations, will agree with us that the entire apparatus of prison and punishment is an abomination which ought to be brought to an end. So that was that was Peter Kropotkin, and um, I completely agree with him on that. 
the ab- the abolition of the prison system as we know it today is imperative to human freedom. I mean, you can talk all the shit you want about Russian gulags and looking at you right wingers, but our system today is far and beyond whatever or what that could have ever hoped to be. Right. The United States has far more people imprisoned right now than the gulags ever did. Both in terms of raw numbers and percentage of the population, we don't even come clo- or they don't even come close. But uh, yeah, anyway. By the way, um, weed is legal in many states where people are still imprisoned for having faced charges before the shit got legalized. So just a reminder. We have people still sitting in jail for having sold a fucking joint while corporations are out here making billions off of selling weed. Yeah. This is an unethical law. Okay, that that type of shit needs to be banned from our law books. Because again, where there is no victim, there is no crime. Agreed. The deterrent influence of law on the lazy man is too absurd to merit consideration. If society were only relieved of the waste and expense of keeping a lazy class, and the equally great expense of the paraphernalia of protection this lazy class requires, the social tables would contain an abundance for all, including even the occasional lazy individual. Besides, it is well to consider that laziness results either from special privileges or physical and mental abnormalities. Our present insane system of production fosters both. Still does. And the most astounding phenomenon is that people should want to work at all now. Anarchism aims to strip labor of its deadening, dulling aspect, of its gloom and compulsion. It aims to make work an instrument of joy, of strength, of color, of real harmony, so that the poorest sort of a man should find in work both recreation and hope. Fuck yeah. To achieve such an arrangement of life, government, with its unjust, arbitrary, repressive measures, must be done away with. At best, it has but imposed one single mode of life upon all, without regard to individual and social variations and needs. In destroying government and statutory laws, anarchism proposes to rescue the self-respect and independence of the individual from all restraint and invasion by authority. Only in freedom can man grow to his full stature. Only in freedom will he learn to think and move and give the very best in him. Only in freedom will he realize the true force of the social bonds which knit men together and which are the true foundation of a normal social life. But what about human nature? Can it be changed? And if not, will it endure under anarchism? So just a quick um interjection here like who's to say that human nature needs to drastically change i think in terms of our actual nature we're, we're we'd probably be closer to like a like a tribal system you know like an indigenous type setting um i i don't th- Exactly, unity. I, I don't I don't think that we really need to rethink human nature. We need to get back to human nature. Precisely. That's the thing is right now we are accustomed to being completely fucking separated from our nature. It is not natural to fucking, you know, have an alarm clock, go off at the ass crack of dawn, wake up, wash your ass, eat your breakfast, go to work, work all fucking day, come home eat a meal, watch a TV show, fall asleep, wash, rinse, repeat. That is not fucking natural. Not at all. Right. Living in a communal sense where 
everyone is throwing down in the garden to grow the food that's going to feed everyone in the neighborhood, that's getting back to our natural state, our actual human nature, things like that. Um, Agreed. Absolutely you know, agree. It's one of those things of like, you know, some people I am so thankful are, are finally waking up to that. And we have an entire movement of permaculture happening where people are learning how to actually work with the environment. And right now we are at a point in technology where we can automate the nasty jobs that nobody fucking wants. We can automate production for most things. And we can free up our fucking time then to instead of doing shit labor that nobody's ever going to enjoy or feel, feel fulfilled in. And instead put that time into creating, into growing food, into actually doing things that uplift your quality of life and those around you. I don't care whether that's knitting hats and gloves for all the kids in the neighborhood or, you know, because... Some people have physical disabilities where they can't physically go throw down in the garden, for example. But there's other things that you do that you create that you can share of. One of my friends who is like of the most disabled you could possibly get between losing her vision and having health issues that stop her in her tracks still does everything in her power to contribute to the community and goes and works with Food Not Bombs, and she teaches music lessons and things like that. There's always something of value that you bring to the table, even with disability. So going back to like what she was describing there of how they look at those of us who are disabled as the lazy class, being disabled has never stopped me from wanting to contribute anything. It's right. limited financially, but it's never fucking stopped me from wanting to do what I can with the skills that I have. And that right there is where I call bullshit on those right wing talking points that deem us the lazy class. Hell yeah. Agreed. Poor human nature. What horrible crimes have been committed in thy name? Every fool from king to policeman, from the flat-headed parson to the visionless dabbler in science, presumes to speak authoritatively of human nature. The greater the mental charlatan, the more definite his insistence on the wickedness and weaknesses of human nature. Yet how can anyone speak of it today with every soul in a prison, with every heart fettered, wounded, and maimed? John Burroughs has stated that experimental study of animals in captivity is absolutely useless. Their character, their habits, their appetites undergo a complete transformation when torn from their soil in field and forest. With human nature caged in a narrow space, whipped daily into submission, how can we speak of its potentialities? Right. Freedom, expansion, opportunity, and above all, peace and repose alone can teach us the real dominant factors of human nature and all its wonderful possibilities. Anarchism, then, really stands for the liberation of the human mind from the dominion of religion, the liberation of the human body from the dominion of property, liberation from the shackles and restraint of government. Anarchism stands for a social order based on the free grouping of individuals for the purpose of producing real social wealth an order that will guarantee to every human being free access to the earth and full enjoyment of the necessities of life according to individual desires, tastes, and inclinations. This is not a wild fancy or an aberration of the mind. It is the conclusion arrived at by hosts of intellectual men and women the world over, a conclusion resulting from the close and studious observation of the tendencies of modern society individual liberty and economic equality, the twin forces for the birth of what is fine and true in man. As to methods, 
Anarchism is not, as some may suppose, a theory of the future to be realized through divine inspiration. It is a living force in the affairs of our life, constantly creating new conditions. The methods of anarchism, therefore, do not comprise an ironclad program to be carried out under all circumstances. Methods must grow out of the economic needs of each place and clime, and of the intellectual and temperamental requirements of the individual. Just a, a quick little tiny interjection here uh, to, to say that on the communist side of it, that's the same. Right. Methods must grow out of the economic needs of each place and clime and of the intellectual and temperamental requirements of the individual. Yep. That's all. To me, each person... The serene, calm character of sorry. a Tolstoy... I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just say, it's to me, each person's need where they are at. You know? Like this person might have housing but need food. This this person might have access to food but need housing. Each has a different need that needs to be met, but either way, there is a standard that we need to raise their material conditions to. Right. Right. Joy will wish different methods for social reconstruction than the intense overflowing personality of a Michael Bakunin or a Peter Kropotkin. Equally so, it must be apparent that the economic and political needs of Russia will dictate more drastic measures than would England or America. Anarchism does not stand for military drill and uniformity. It does, however, stand for the spirit of revolt in whatever form against everything that hinders human growth. All anarchists agree in that, as they also agree in their opposition to the political machinery as a means of bringing about the great social change. All voting, says Thoreau, is a sort of gaming, like checkers or backgammon, a playing with right and wrong. Its obligation never exceeds that of expediency. Even voting for the right thing is doing nothing for it. A wise man will not leave the right to the mercy of chance, nor wish it to prevail through the power of the majority. A close examination of the machinery of politics and its achievements will bear out the logic of Thoreau. What does the history of parliamentarism show? Nothing but failure and defeat. Not even a single reform to ameliorate the economic and social stress of the people. Just an interjection. This was obviously written before the New Deal. I'm sure she would have some things to say about that placating the masses, much like she did about the women's suffrage movement. Yep. Um, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Laws have been passed and enactments made for the improvement and protection of labor. Thus it was proven only last year that Illinois, with the most rigid laws for mine protection, had the greatest mine disasters. In states where child labor laws prevail, child exploitation is at its highest. And though with us the workers enjoy full political opportunities, capitalism has reached the most brazen zenith. Even were the workers able to have their own representatives, for which so, our goods... So, I, I, I know I was uh, late in um, pausing that, but zenith is not a word that we hear too much these days it's a tv brand or it was but obviously that's not what she's referring to i um, i think here she means like an apex of well right right but i i pulled it up in the dictionary the the there's two definitions technically but obviously she's referring to definition one the time at which something is most powerful or most successful yes High point, crowning point, so on. Uh, the other definition is uh, pertaining to astronomy, the point in the sky or celestial sphere directly over an observer. But uh, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure exactly what zenith meant. I mean, context clues pretty much gave me the de the definition, but just in case anybody else. 
you know, was caught up on that. I wanted to. Right. Cause most people who at least, you know, are old enough to remember them would have immediately gotten a mental picture of a TV, big ass TV encased in wood with like a fucking dial on there that only goes up to 13. I remember I had one. Yep. <laughs> My grandma had one, and that's exactly what I thought of when I saw that, and I was like, well, that's obviously not what she's saying, so. (laughs) The TV brand was named thus because they were, at the time, the epitome of a dope-ass TV. Well, and I mean, I would say the, the, obviously not the point in the sky, but, uh, you know, like, I, I don't know. Yeah, I was trying to tie in the second definition, but I give up. <laughs> hey, it's it's two in the morning. <laughs> well, well, it's I'm eleven scared, here. But yeah, yeah. I, I hope I hope that the people that are watching the stream like look at their phones. Like, wait a minute, no, it's not. <laughs> Pre-record. <laughs> but right. yeah. Well, I mean, remember on the page, they still show up as a live stream. True, true. So, yeah, I guess it's good that we point that out, that we are pre-recording this to be able to handle the struggle of the juggle. It helps. The the juggle struggle. Yes. It's the, the shit that we do when everyone else is winding their day down and, you know, relaxing in bed and watching a movie. We're in here. Still working. Yep. I work all day to come home and work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Struggle and, the uh, job. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I mean, honestly, this is more fulfilling than what I do at my day job, but. <laughs> Far more. Yeah. But, you know, this is a labor of love right here. This is what we're referring to. When we say that not getting paid cash for something is not going to make you lose your inspiration to do it any fucking ways. Speaking of which, if you do want to support us materially um, so so we can grow this thing or, yes. you know, so we can start a nonprofit and use those funds to help other people, um, either way... Uh, you can contribute at patreon.com slash for we are many or uh, on the side of pretty much any page on our website for we are many.org. There are links to both our Patreon and PayPal. So uh, it's pretty easy and convenient. And it certainly does help because believe it or not, we've already got bills that, <laughs> you know, We've been paying for a while. Matter of fact, there's features that we would like to add to this, you know, streaming service that we use that we can't do unless we start bringing some money in to pay for that, you know, because right. life has the bills. Um, but if that's, you know, something you would like to help contribute to the growth of, those options are there and we appreciate it. Indeed. The more more we grow, the more people we can reach and actually maybe see this revolution come to fruition in our lifetimes. Yeah. Well said. Socialist politicians are clamoring. What chances are there for their honesty and good faith? One has but to bear in mind the process of politics to realize that its path of good intentions is full of pitfalls. Wire pulling, intriguing, flattering, lying, cheating. In fact, chicanery of every description whereby the political aspirant can achieve success. Added to that is a complete demoralization of character and conviction until nothing is left that would make one hope for anything from such a human derelict. Time and time again the people were foolish enough to trust, believe, and support with their last farthing aspiring politicians only to find themselves betrayed and cheated. 
it may be claimed that men of integrity would not become corrupt in the political grinding mill. Perhaps not. But such men would be absolutely helpless to exert the slightest influence in behalf of labor, as indeed has been shown in numerous instances. The state is the economic master of its servants. Good men, if such there be, would either remain true to their political faith and lose their economic support, or they would cling to their economic master and be utterly unable to do the slightest good. The political arena leaves one no alternative. One must either be a dunce or a rogue. The political superstition is still holding sway over the hearts and minds of the masses, but the true lovers of liberty will have no more to do with it. Instead, they believe with Sterner that man has as much liberty as he is willing to take. Anarchism, therefore, stands for direct action, the open defiance of and resistance to all laws and restrictions, economic, social, and moral. But defiance and resistance are illegal. Therein lies the salvation of man. Everything illegal necessitates integrity, self-reliance, and courage. In short, it calls for free, independent spirits, for men who are men and who have a bone in their backs which you cannot pass your hand through. Universal suffrage itself owes its existence to direct action. If not for the spirit of rebellion, of the defiance on the part of the American Revolutionary Fathers, their posterity would still wear the king's coat. I feel like this is missing some historical context. I mean, I mean she is from America, um, and, and I think that that shows in this, the, the way she talks about the American Revolutionary Fathers. She's not from America. She's from... Or, well, right, I, I, I misspoke. She's in America for correct. a long time. Right. Yeah, she lived in America for many years. Before she, she referred to it as her hunting grounds of decades. <laughs> yes. Yes. She did eventually get um, kicked out, sent back to Russia because of her political views and acting upon them. But we went into that in our pieces specifically on her life. So if you want to know more about that story, it's an intriguing one. Intriguing one. Little, again, 2 a.m. Tired. But um, it involves murder. Well, it's yeah. murder and conspiracy. It's beautiful. And uh, I, I wanted to pause it there both to point out, uh, you know, the living in America certainly had to have impacted her view of America's forefathers. Um, yes. But this next line... I wanted to get everybody's attention before this next line as well. Because so. John Brown was a badass. Yes. And if you don't know who he if is... It's not for the... Yeah, for real. If you don't know who he is, look him up. Oh, my God. He went around slaughtering slave owners and freeing slaves. He was quite the badass. Yeah. The direct action of a John Brown and his comrades, America would still trade in the flesh of the black man. I want to reread that sentence for clarity. If not for the direct, uh, direct action of a John Brown and his comrades, America would still trade in the flesh of a black man. It's true. He made slave owners more afraid to keep him than to let them loose when he showed up. Yeah. Well, I mean, if he showed up, it's probably too late, but... <laughs> well, yeah, like, you, they really didn't have the option of keeping... I mean, like, trying to keep their slaves. You know, if you try, you're going to die. Even if you don't, you still might die. <laughs> because you're a yeah. fucking slave owner in trash. And John Brown feels that uh, you need to die for that. And he's not wrong. Yeah. And I mean, we've talked about John Brown a lot. We really do but need to we, do a piece on him. I know, but it's going to have to at least be a two-parter, if not three or four. I mean, I'm if okay we're going to... 
if we're going to go into detail, like on who he was, what structured his beliefs, what led to his actions, what his actions were, what the fallout was. And of course, you know, his trial and execution. Yes. Anyway. He was a hero. Back to That's a true the, American hero right there. And he should agreed. not have been executed. Agreed. But I mean, let's not forget that the state that killed him just finally took down their most prominent Confederate statue. Fair. Finally. Yeah. Finally. Finally. Mother. Anyway. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Back to the tax. <laughs> True, the trade in white flesh is still going on, but that too will have to be abolished by direct action. Trade unionism, the economic arena of the modern gladiator, owes its existence to direct action. Got it is but recently that law and government have attempted to crush the trade union movement and condemned the exponents of man's right to organize to prison as conspirators. Had they sought to assert their cause through begging, pleading, and compromise, trade unionism would today be a negligible quantity. In France, in Spain, in Italy, in Russia, nay, even in England, witness the growing rebellion of English labor unions. Direct revolutionary economic action has become so strong a force in the battle for industrial liberty as to make the world realize the tremendous importance of labor's power. The general strike, the supreme expression of the economic consciousness of the workers, was ridiculed in America but a short time ago. Today, every great strike, in order to win, must realize the importance of the solidaric general protest. Fuck Direct man. action, having proven effective along economic lines, is equally potent in the environment of the individual. There, a hundred forces encroach upon his being, and only persistent resistance to them will finally set him free. Direct action against the authority in the shop. Direct action against the authority of the law. Direct action against the invasive, meddlesome authority of our moral code is the logical, consistent method of anarchism. Will it not lead to a revolution? Indeed it will. No real social change has ever come about without a revolution. Lenin said something very similar. Yep. A revolution really does shape our future. A revolution is the only thing that brings about real societal changes. So that, uh, that line was very important, as is this next one. Uh, I, I will read and then let this reiterate instead of doing it the other way around and pausing it again. People are either not familiar with their history or they have not yet learned that revolution is but thought carried into action. That sounds a whole lot like Mao, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Again, common ground in thought. Yeah. And application. <laughs> right uh, um but yeah just to, matters right right direct action without theory is just direct action but direct action with theory is praxis yes it um but i just want to reiterate that line so here it is again People are either not familiar with their history, or they have not yet learned that revolution is but thought carried into action. Anarchism, the great leaven of thought, is today permeating every phase of human endeavor. Science, art, literature, the drama, the effort for economic betterment, in fact, Every individual in social opposition to the existing disorder of things is illumined by the spiritual light of anarchism. It is the philosophy of the sovereignty of the individual. It is the theory of social harmony. It is the great, surging, living truth that is reconstructing the world, 
and that will usher in the dawn. Love it. Fucking love it. I just had to give that an ov ovation because, again, she was one amazing orator. Yeah. Um, so chapter two, which is going to be next Monday at the same time, is called Minorities versus Majorities. Um, I, I mean, I'm hoping without reading ahead that this is going to have to do with intersections, the intersectionality between race and class and gender and class and race and gender. Um, I'm hoping that basically what she's going to lay out in this essay is um, uplifting minorities, basically. Just knowing what I do already of her, you know, staunch stances when it comes to even the gender war, the sexism that, you know, her generation was dealing with at that point in time. I imagine you're right in that presumption of where she's going to go next. And I can't wait. Same. <laughs> Um, but we've, we've done enough, uh, I think probably shameless self-promotion throughout this, but just a quick recap though, our website is for we are Uh, we do on Mondays, we do anarchism and other essays with bread theory. Um, on Tuesdays we do our current event stream. We pick, you know, four five, six, whatever stories. Um, from around the world and kind of talk about them from our own perspective rather than from a corporate pers uh, perspective. Um, and, you know, try to, when we can, we try to present alternatives or options. Um, anyway, Wednesdays is our other book club day. Um, and that is... Uh, Lenin State and Revolution currently, which is actually a bread theory stream. Uh, you'll have to go to his um, platforms. Uh, you'll have to find him on podcast platforms. That's bread underscore theory to find part one because we were not yet involved. Uh, but we do have part two, which is chapter two on for we are many dot org. And then Thursday we are reading. Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice. Um, and then Fridays are generally, at least for now, until it goes back to Wednesdays, um, are historical pieces. Uh, this week's is the White Panther Party and the MC5. Um, it was kind of a fun episode to record. I, I mean, I wish the that Trisha would have been free to do it with me because I feel like the end result would have been better uh, with two voices rather than one. Um, we wanted to get down on that one with you too, but that's okay. We can revisit that like we were yeah. discussing and actually throw some discussion in there too since it was mostly reading. But Yeah, exactly. Um, there's so also some music from the MC5 in there. Um, the band owns the rights to their music and they've only sued one person, well, one organization, I should say, for trying to sell things with their music. Um, who was so I, I'm curious. I don't remember who it was actually, but, um, I took a chance, um, playing some live MC5 in that episode. Um, well, that said, we're also not trying to profiteer off of their work either, you know? Right. Right. So it's just a matter of sharing that because it's important to the piece. It's right. Good. Right. I mean, the MC5's music career partially funded the White Panther Party and the White Panther Party's politics were pre uh, prevalent in their live shows. So 
Anyway. It goes hand in hand. Right. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Do you, if you got anything else? Um, Not that I can think of. Other than there's a huge section of this chapter we just read that I kind of want to copy and take into court with me and read. <laughs> like hmm, I can't. They would be that. like, "Ma'am, anarchy is not law," and you'd be like, "That's the fucking point." <laughs> Precisely. Your laws exist merely to try to exert control under a false sense of authority. Fuck you! I'm your employer, and I don't right. want. <laughs> you know. Right. Anyway, I'm exhausted, and we're about three hours into this. I see you're yawning, too, so we should probably wrap this up here. But, um, yes, we will see you tomorrow night, and the night after that, and the night after that, and the night after that. So until next time, love, peace, solidarity. <laughs>